Between the NICU having premature twins and hormones from IVF and then the hurricane and not taking care of myself and the pure exhaustion, it was the perfect storm for postpartum. There was a lot of fear, anxiety, panic attacks, and it was really, really hard to manage. That's Danielle Kobo, a change management, leadership development, and burnout prevention consultant. In the past few years, Danielle's had some huge challenges, from losing her mother to suicide, to taking care of her premature twin babies in the middle of a hurricane, to her husband's deployment in Iraq, and then navigating a toxic work environment. When she finally hit a wall, Danielle decided to use her own difficult experiences to help others develop grit, resilience, and courage to thrive in the workplace. Sometimes you look back and we go, those times and those challenges that we have in our life are preparing us for future situations that happen. And now I'm able to share that with others and say, hey, it is possible to overcome challenges and here are the steps to do it. On this episode, Danielle takes us through her process for conquering self-doubt, identifying burnout, and following your purpose. You'll hear about the book she's writing about her experiences, the many unbelievable curveballs she's been thrown, and how she's managed them all. Welcome to The Breakout, a show about smashing through life's little boxes and forging your own path. I'm Dr. Carrie Ulrich. And I'm Kelly Gunther. Carrie and I are people and change experts and best friends. We've spent more than 25 years helping organizations navigate change and get the best out of their people. Come on, we know change is hard, but staying the same can even be harder. On The Breakout, we prove that you can escape expectations and best of all, we show you how. I am so happy that Danielle's with us. I already know it's gonna be a great conversation. So you're talking about resiliency and tell us what happened in March of 2020. So I think that probably sparked a lot of this. Why am I going to write this book and why am I helping others with resiliency? 2020 was a pivotal year for a lot of people. The world had completely shut down. We were, I would say, on the go a lot. And all of a sudden, we are in a position of being at home with our family and not traveling on the road. And there was a lot of challenges through that time, but I also found that a lot of us kind of took a step back and said, what do I really want in life? 2020 started with my husband coming home from a deployment. So he had spent 2019 deployed in Iraq. Our twin boys, high energy, thrill-seeking twin boys were two (laughs) at the time. So he came back January 26, then March 8th. I unfortunately lost my mom and she had passed away from suicide. Mm. So it was, it was really heartbreaking to lose her in that way. Yeah. And then in March 13th, so only a week, week and a half later then the pandemic hit, shut the world down. And my husband and I were still navigating through this new transition in life. People will always ask, I don't know how you did it when your husband was deployed. And you kind of just take it one day at a time and just find your way. And But coming home, that was a big transition. They're coming home from a war. They're a different person. And before my husband left, our kids were barely talking. They were finger foods. And all of a sudden, he comes back and they have a vocabulary, they're eating from a fork. So it was a big transition, not only how do he and I reconnect as a couple, but also how does he connect with these boys that he had missed half of their life. Mm -hmm. And then to add to that, a few months later, my work environment became a very toxic environment. And I decided to leave the company that I was with for seven years, a company that I thought I was going to retire with. And because I had tied so much of my identity to my career, I felt completely lost. And so how did you even manage those first couple of months, Danielle? It was really challenging. Yeah. They do come back different. He was in a high stress situation. There was one point that I was on the phone with him and I hear this incoming, incoming, 
take cover, take cover, accountability, accountability. And it was the night that 13 missiles hit his base. Oh my God. So he was in a high stress environment and he's used to, as an officer, kind of directing where they're going in a very direct, concise, specific way. And he comes home to two and a half year olds (laughs) that are (laughs) developing a Mm. sense of opinion. (laughs) They are still navigating through how to process their emotions and they're throwing temper tantrums and he's going, wait a minute here. And he, he joked around, he's like, leading soldiers is easier than leading kids. 100%. So he comes back. I'm still working, and now he is this stay-at-home dad. So it was, there were some arguments. There were some challenges in the marriage. For me, with the pandemic and being shut down and my kids are immune compromised, they have respiratory issues and asthma, I was stressed on what would happen if my kids got sick. Would we be back in the hospital? So there was a lot of fear, anxiety, panic attacks. And my stomach would would churn with pain of, of that anxiety. And it was really, really hard to manage. And then add on the toxic work environment. Right. I was so unhappy. And I didn't necessarily know it at the time, but looking back, I was miserable. And so what was that moment where you're like, that's it, I'm leaving this job, I'm starting my own business. What was that like? It was not immediate. When I decided to leave the company, I immediately started to find a new job. And then my husband was like, use this time to really discover what makes you happy. What do you want this next phase in your life to be? And it started with, there was so much negativity in the world. And I said, you know what, why don't I use this time to share and and motivate others and inspire others? And so I started posting on LinkedIn. I just started to post motivational quotes. There was a lot of people that were looking for a job and being a former hiring manager, I said, well, maybe I can share some wisdom on how to get a job and how to interview. And through that process, it actually became really healing for me. I started to shift that mind, you know, from those negative thoughts to positive. Then I started to get to a point where I said, you know what, Um, the healing process of sharing is helpful as well. So then I started to share my stories of my mom and losing her and people were reaching out to me saying, thank you so much. I've dealt with that as well. And it's so nice to have somebody share their story. And it ended up, me sharing posts online ended up with people then reaching out to me saying, can you help me find a job? Would you mentor me on how to hit my sales quota? I want to start a business. I'm thinking about leaving corporate. Can you help me guide this business? And there was a lot of doubt in the beginning. I didn't want to be a business owner. In fact, I pushed back a lot, but it took a day where I was on the phone with a recruiter and I was talking about kind of my experience. And she said, Danielle, I'd love to bring you with a company. You have a great background, but the passion behind how you talk about helping people, you are meant to do this. Stop applying to jobs online. Wow. Yeah, it was the best advice I ever was ever given. Wow. I love that a recruiter is like, I'm not going to hire this one. I could, I could close that wreck, but like, thank goodness for that recruiter. Holy smoke. Yeah. She will always hold a very special place in my heart. You shared some really personal stuff. How long did it take you to get, like, get right with that? Cause it's hard to share. Yeah. It was really hard for me to share in the beginning. In fact, when I was with the company, I went through a 360 review. So Mm -hmm. people were able to take a survey and provide feedback. It was everybody on my team. It was my peers and leadership team. It was my director. And the feedback given was not authentic and not a risk taker. Really? Yeah. So, and it's (gasps) interesting to look back and say, wait a minute. (laughs) Holy smoke. Uh, I left corporate and started a business. And in my book, I share very, very vulnerable stories. And it happened because when I started to share the stories of losing my mom, of the some of the challenges I had in leadership and 
the things I did wrong and the learning lessons along the way, when people started to reach out to me and say, thank you so much for sharing that story. You know, you helped me get the confidence to interview for that position and I got the job. Hearing how I was making an impact on people's lives is what inspired me to say, by being vulnerable, by being authentic, that's how you actually have true, intimate relationships with people. And yes, it takes a lot of courage. And yes, it's scary. And there's going to be people that are going to judge you for it. But Brene Brown, I saw her Netflix special, and she had said something that resonated. And she says, if you're not willing to get in the vulnerable arena with me, then I don't care about your opinion. Danielle's transition from high-powered sales leader to coaching people through their most vulnerable times was really intriguing to both Carrie and I. I really appreciate what Danielle is doing in terms of trying to help others and sharing her stories and being that vulnerable. That's hard to do. It's hard to have a parent who committed suicide and share that. Talk about her husband coming home being a different person managing through a toxic work, their postpartum depression, it's a lot. And so to turn that around, talk about how you can be resilient and face burnout and overcome it and try to help people, I just think it's beautiful. And to start from a salesperson, which usually is a very different profile of focus on money, goals, this is a big, a big swing. So I think it's amazing. Agreed. Danielle's experience with her premature twins added an extra layer to her already stressful life. And then she had to manage it all during a hurricane. I was pregnant with twins. I actually delivered early. So I had an emergency C-section delivered early. They were six weeks premature. And they spent 17 days in the NICU. So I distinctly remember the moment when I delivered my boys and one of them came out blue Mm. and I was petrified. And I was very, very fortunate. There was a NICU team that immediately, there was five, five nurses on each baby and went straight to the NICU. That was the start of my postpartum and I didn't necessarily know it at the time. Two weeks after they get home from the NICU, I wasn't taking care of myself very well. I was so focused on taking care of them that I wasn't taking care of me. And I ended up getting gallstones Mm. and ended up being rushed to the emergency room. The doctor comes in and he says, you have gallstones and you need to get your your, um, gallbladder removed today. Mm. And right when he's telling me that, I see on the TV, breaking news, category four hurricane headed to Tampa. It was Irma. Oh, my God. And while I'm sitting here watching this, I get a call from my husband and he says, the hurricane's coming. We need to relocate because he's a Blackhawk pilot. So we need to relocate the helicopters up to the northeast. And so I've been activated. So I looked at the doctor and I said, I can't have surgery today. I need to go home. We're boarding up the house. A hurricane hits our house and we lost power for four days. So my boys, one of them was on a heart monitor hooked up to a generator. It's completely dark in the house on top of the fact that they were premature. So they were feed one for an hour and a half, feed the second one for an hour and a half, then an hour break, and it was around the clock. And we were just exhausted. So between the NICU having premature twins and hormones from IVF and And then the hurricane and not taking care of myself and the pure exhaustion, it was the perfect storm for postpartum. Mm -hmm. And navigating through and taking the steps of how to overcome postpartum is what gave me the tools to thrive that year that my husband was deployed. Because when he was deployed, I had the twins. I was traveling and doing overnights every week. I was very fortunate to have a support system to do that. But Sometimes you look back and we go, those times and those challenges that we have in our life are preparing us for future situations that happen. And now I'm able to share that with others and say, hey, it is possible to overcome challenges. And here are the steps to do it. 
What are some of the common problems that you see with the clients you work with or the common themes you're seeing? One of the most common themes that I'm seeing right now is there's a lot of self-doubt. People that are looking for the job and they say, well, I don't have industry experience. I don't have enough experience. I see a lot of self-doubt when people are in sales and they're going, I don't know if I can hit my quota or I don't know if I can start a business. So self-doubt is a big theme that I'm seeing right now. And the second one is this sense of loss of purpose. I've had some clients who said, I've earned President's Club and I and for top performance, and I thought that I would be really happy, but I'm not happy and I can't figure out why. And so those are the two most common themes that I see. How do you help the clients kind of move through some of this thinking so they can move past the self-doubt and they can figure out their purpose? So it's a three-step process. And the first one is reprogramming these negative beliefs that we have. I call it the internal troll that just sits on our shoulder and just feeds this negativity. You're not good enough. You're not smart enough. You're not successful enough. You can't do X, Y, Z. And so what I'll say is sit yourself in a quiet room, take a piece of paper, write down every negative belief that you've told yourself over the years, every negative belief. And I really say, give it some time. Give it 30 minutes and really try to dig deep. I distinctly remember being told in high school that I, because my mom and I kind of had a difficult relationship, that I I wouldn't be able to succeed in life. So these, these negative beliefs that were told early on in our childhood, and then some of the failures feed into this negativity. So I'll say, go in in a room, write these all down. And my favorite exercise is actually to write them on a white porcelain plate. And so you take a black Sharpie, start in the middle, work your way around the plate, then put that plate in a brown paper bag, staple it just to be safe as you're not getting glass everywhere and physically (laughs) shatter those negative beliefs. Like with every force that you have, shatter those negative beliefs. And then once you've done that step, then it's about the reprogramming. So then you write on a piece of paper, what are some of the affirmations that I get to tell myself? It could be transferring into, I'm going to build a strategic business plan to exceed my goal and I'm going to earn President's Club. It could be, I can't get this job because I don't have the qualifications to, I have the transferable skills to add a fresh and new perspective to this job that I'm applying to. And then once we've looked at the affirmations that you get to tell yourself, then it is about understanding your unique strengths. So I, when I left corporate, I posted on Facebook and I said, if there was one word you would use to describe me, what would it be? And I was flooded with comments on inspiring, motivating. And, and that was, it was so good to hear because I was going, wow, I had no idea that that's the impact that I made on people's lives. So you take all of those words And then you turn them into a word cloud. You upload all of those words and you create this word cloud. And then you put it above your desk. And anytime you're experiencing self-doubt, you look at that word cloud. So first it's reprogram the negative beliefs, understand your unique strengths. And then the third step is discover your purpose. And this may seem like an odd, uncomfortable exercise. And I I absolutely get it. So I'm just going to preface it by saying that, but write a eulogy and you'll write a eulogy from two perspectives, one from your coworkers perspective and one from your family's and friends perspective. And so if you think about when you pass and that time comes, what do you want people to say about you at your funeral? And I understand it's uncomfortable. It may sound morbid, but it helps you discover what is your purpose? What is the legacy that you want to leave behind? Mm. And how can I use that to always live in integrity with myself? So those are the three steps that I would say to really transition out of self-doubt into confidence and courage to discover what your unique strengths are and then to also uncover what your purpose is. Mm. I, I so like those, Danielle, and I love a good eulogy. That is a great exercise because here's the thing. It shouldn't be morbid because there's one thing we can all agree on. All of us pass. It happens to everyone, rich, poor. So there will be a eulogy. 
Mm-hmm. What do you want it to say? And it's such a good way to ensure that you're driving toward your purpose. So I love that. When you were saying that the plate, all I could think about is my wonderful bestie, Kelly, who I can't remember why. I think you were ticked at something mm-hmm. and you broke a bunch of plates. Mm-hmm. 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 Kelly has a good fire to her. I do. It, it's a good release. I only wish I put some of those amazing words on those plates. It's a great visual. And I think there is something beautiful about releasing things that don't no longer work for you. Thank you so much for that wisdom and for sharing your beautiful story too. Just when I thought it, it could not get any more difficult in your life, Danielle, here comes another story where I'm like, gallstones, surgery, hurricane, husband has to leave, No power, four days, generator, heart monitor. I I mean, I just can't even imagine the amount of resilience. When it comes to the subject of burnout, which is something that I think we're reading about even more in terms of hybrid work and how do you find the right balance, what would you say are the common signs of burnout and why does it happen to people? There's two areas to look at when you're looking at burnout. One of them is the physical and then one of them is the emotional. Mm. So the physical is, I, I have this exercise in my book and it's called the weekly body scan. Our bodies will let us know when we are burned out. However, we often just continue to push and push and push. So when you are intentional about doing the weekly body scan, you can very early on see the signs and that will help you reflect as to what the triggers are that are creating that burnout. So when you stand in front of a mirror, you start at the very top of your head and you look at your hair. Is your hair, is it brittle? Is it dull? Is it thinning? Is it falling out? That is a sign of burnout. You look at your skin. Do you have bags under your eyes? Are you breaking out with acne? That could either be food or hormone or stress related. Then you work down to your decollete. I know that when I was in medical sales every third quarter during the summer, I would break out in hives. That was a time where I would just push through and not be in tuned as to, well, why do I have, what's triggering these hives? Then you work down and you go to your stomach. Is you, are you lethargic? And do you have an upset tummy all the time? Are you getting heartburn? I would say gallstones would be <laughs> one example of that. Are you getting sharp pains in your stomach? But Being intentional at doing the weekly body scan is going to help you in identifying what the triggers are early on. And so there's the weekly body scan, and then there's the emotional. So some of the emotional signs of burnout is stress, Mm -hmm. is feeling overwhelmed, is being quick to be irritated. I could be quick to anger. Those are some of the emotional signs of burnout. I would also say... Being self-critical is another one. Are we just quick to criticize? Do we lash out at people when somebody cuts you off on the road? Do you find yourself throwing up your arms and yelling at them and getting all mad even though they can't hear you with your windows up? Surprise, surprise, they can't hear you. So you're yelling at yourself. And as one psychologist had shared with me, when you yell in the car, you're filling up that room and that space with anger. So if there's anybody in the car, they're feeling that anger as well. Those those are some of the, the signs of emotional burnout. As soon as she said mirror, I thought, yeah, well, that's not happened with Gunther. No, but wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be interesting, Kelly? It, you know, what I appreciate about it is that it really is like that smack in your face. Mm-hmm. It is the ultimate, like, you you have to confront the reality of your life. Mm-hmm. You know, like, burnout looks like this. Mm-hmm. This is the face of burnout or whatever <laughs> it is. You know, like. <laughs> I also think that Kelly was probably very triggered from all the discussion of traffic and yelling at traffic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm like, that's me. I got, there's like. Am I really that burned out and emotionally stressed out? Because she's always yelling at traffic. Like, check the box. (laughs) Bags under the eyes. Like, is your skin droopy? Like, oh, God, you know? Well, I guess I I failed that one already. Oh, wow. I was still thinking of you, Kelly, because I thought, oh, God, she's going down this checklist. And I know my Gunther. She's like, shit. Yep. Yep. 
Yep. So I don't know if it's his burnout or it's just Kelly has a really friggin' high bar. I feel the need to educate while I'm on the road. So, yeah. you know, that's what I call it. I am educating you on why you need to be a better driver and just a better person overall. Yeah. Brought to you by Kelly Gunther. <laughs> Masters in Adult Education. This is your life's mission to help others, whether they want to or not. <laughs> or not. Yeah. Or not. Yep. Yep. You know, you've worked for an organization like Carrie and myself, where there is safety in knowing that you have, you know, a steady job, a career. Do you go into day in and day out? And then there's obviously the independent side of, you know, you own your own business and there's the hustle and the grind and the uncertainty that comes with that. So what would you say now that you've gone out on your own, what's your perspective on that safety net? I believe that sometimes we have a false sense of what safety is in corporate I worked for an organization when we went through downsizing, acquisitions, restructuring. One day, I remember within my first year of management, I lost half of my team, four out of the eight people on my team in one day. So there is a false sense of security in working from corporate. I also understand that there is a security in having a steady paycheck, having insurance, having 401k benefits. I was very fortunate to also have stock options. And I would say that this is something that I struggle with daily, even still today. And it's this constant back and forth in my head. But every time I have those moments of self-doubt and every time I have those moments of going, I wish, I remind myself that I am not living out of a suitcase every day. Before <laughs> I had my boys, I spent 250 nights in a hotel mm. in one year. I was excited when I hit Diamond Delta and I put that badge on my luggage and I was like, yes, I've accomplished a goal. My goal is I've spent more nights in a hotel room than I did in my own house. Why did I celebrate that? <laughs> There's, I know I look back and I'm like, this is so funny. But I think of that, I think of, wow, I spent so much time on the road and now I'm able to put my kids to bed every night and I'm able to spend quality time with them. And I'm able to reconnect with my husband. My husband and I are at a really good point in our marriage. And I've been able to understand what success means to me. I don't define success as a title, an income, a sense of you know, the words that I've earned, I define success as, am I fulfilling a sense of my purpose? And how am I measuring my happiness and where I am now versus where I was before? And it's in those moments where you do take the risk and you take the gamble that you find out the most about yourself and you realize that it was within you the entire time. So as we wrap up our episode, we always like to end by asking, when you have one minute with someone who's stuck and wants to break out, what do you tell them? Hmm. I would say that we all have a unique purpose and strength. And if you can't find it, if you're struggling to find it within yourself, ask the people that are in your life, the people that you trust. People will see things in us that we may not see in ourselves and to listen to it. Beautiful. Thank you so much for, for being with us. Thank you. It was an honor to be on your podcast. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Danielle. That's Danielle Cobo, resilience and grit guru. And this is The Breakout. If this episode inspired you or made you think, give us a five-star rating and spread the word. It helps us reach more people who might just need these stories. And don't forget to subscribe to The Breakout so you never miss a new episode. And make sure you're following us on Instagram at The Breakout Pod. I'm Kelly Gunther. And I'm Dr. Carrie Ulrich. See you next time.